gosh, good evening. What an exceptional turnout this evening. And a couple of people rode our special basketball shuttle, heaven forbid, we're, we're up against a shocker basketball uh, night. And we have a number of very special uh, guests this evening. And so they're going to be multi-part introductions tonight. Um, I want to start by acknowledging some of our VIPs. And we are delighted that Mayor Carl Brewer is with us. And he's going to give remarks in, um, in just a little bit. And Vice Mayor Levanta Williams as well, Cap City Council Member Janet Miller, and her husband, Niall Dilmore, who's also a Kansas House uh, representative from District 92. Wichita Arts and Cultural Manager John DeAngelo and his lovely wife Karen that are here in the crowd. Um, the Wichita uh, Airport Director Victor White and as well the Airport New Terminal Manager. I love the sound of that. New Terminal Manager. And Pat McCollum and his wife Yolanda. Um, and numerous people who are connected to the new airport uh, project and its construction from architects to the public artist as well. But let's not stop there. We have a number of university dignitaries in the audience as well. I want to acknowledge the College of Fine Arts Dean Rodney Miller and Associate Vice President Barth Haig and his wife Betty, who are here in the crowd. I'm not seeing them at the moment, but I know they are. Um, and um, and I'd be remiss to not acknowledge that we have numerous Ulrich Museum Advisory Board members as well. And naturally, the folks that I care most about uh, are our regulars. So all of you, <laughs> salon members. <clears throat> After all those VIPs, sorry. <laughs> Um, we have had, the, we the museum has had just a lot on our plate um, this fall, um, in the past year but this fall, and I am so excited to relay to you that our attendance has been staggering across the fall. Our attendance paced with the fall that we had two years ago when we had the robots exhibition, and that particular year ended up being our highest year of attendance in the past couple of decades. So we've just been doing fabulously well. And of course, it's not the numbers that count. It's the fact that that many people are coming to our galleries and are in our auditorium seats and coming to our family days and, and having such rich encounters with uh, works of art and, and contemporary works. And, of course, it's for all of that that all of you are so generous to the Ulrich because you care about the quality of life in the city and you want our citizens to have that kind of richness to their life and, and quality experience. So I, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being so enlightened and helping our museum. Another not so minor project on our plate um, has been the Miro conservation campaign. And a good number of you in the audience were uh, at the September 7th fun street party that we called See Miro Go. Levanta Williams came and was part of um, the group. We were really trying to shake it up uh, on the street. Well, we are chipping away at our uh, fundraising goal. It's, it's a challenge, but we're, uh, we're getting there, we're making it. And I want to invite Sonia Gretemann to the podium for just a minute or two to say uh, a word. She's on our Moreau campaign committee, and I should also acknowledge she, she's wearing many hats this evening. She's a campaign committee member, and her husband, Chris Brunner, who's also on the committee. She's also the chair of our Ulrich Salon Circle Committee, and she's the person who led the process to identify and, and select and the continuing efforts with the artist for the new airport, Ed Carpenter, from whom we're going to hear this evening. So, well, thank you, Patricia. Well, all I really want to say is I'm going to keep it really brief. Um, in a few days, all of you fabulous salon members are going to receive a packet from us, and it's going to be talking about our Moreau uh, restoration project. And we have a really fun idea. It's be a Moreau hero. And um, one of my writers came up with that. I thought it was pretty clever. <laughs> um, but um, we have an adopt-a-panel. And, you know, if you've 
watch the Moreau. There's um, 76 panels, and so you um, you can adopt one of our panels, and you get your own two by three foot replica of this panel that is um, a mosaic that's created by the staff of the Ulrich. It's pretty cool for a $25,000 donation. Now, the cool thing about it is. It's not so cool for us because the Moreau is going to be down for five years, but you can spread that donation out for five years, 5,000 a year. So anyway, Chris and I have adopted a panel and we hope that you'll join us in adopting one too and get our mosaic Moreau back on our wall. Thank you. Don't forget we know where you live. <laughs> You, you don't want Chris coming after you, apparently. <laughs> so let's shift the evening uh, or the conversation to um, this evening's speaker, who is the remarkable Ed Carpenter. I personally first encountered Ed Carpenter's work when I was at the University of Minnesota. He did a gorgeous large scale piece for the new Carlson School of Management there. And uh, now he's been retained to develop an equal, if not more, stupendous work for our new airport. I'm very pleased to share with you that the, his design proposals were unanimously approved at the Design Council meeting this morning um, here in the city. So it's, it, it, we're moving forward. Carpenter is based in Portland, Oregon and yet his practice is global, it's around the world. He specializes in large-scale sculpture and architectural projects and also in glass. It's been very fascinating to me sort of doing a little bit of research, um, knowing that I was introducing this artist. His training is actually in glass design and technique, and he trained in Germany and in England. And we see that training and also his astounding innovation in the, the myriad works that you're going to see him uh, present this evening with the kind of new possibilities that he creates for glass and lighting in particular. So you'll hear him talk about placemaking and making place <coughs> and that, that's something he does just extraordinarily well in uh, the body of his work. He has commissions here, there, and everywhere in Belfast to Taiwan, in Akita, Japan to Chicago. In the United States, I would tell you that our landscape is littered with Ed Carpenter work. He has work in Los Angeles to Seattle and in Dallas and New York, and the list encompasses pages. He's the recipient of numerous high honors, including two National Endowment for the Arts Artist Fellowships and as well awards from such organizations as the American Institute for Architects and Americans for the Arts. In Wichita, as you're now well aware, he's engaged in our airport project, um, and yet he's, um, he's experienced at this. He's a veteran. He's done public artworks for airports in Miami, Houston, Raleigh-Durham, Phoenix, Portland, and he's currently working on the new Las Vegas airport and a really epic scale project for them. All of which suffices to say that Ed Carpenter is a recognized master at his game. We are so fortunate that he's going to bring his talents to our city and, and our new airport. And to share uh, just a few more words of welcome, um, please help me both to acknowledge and applaud the great job that our mayor is doing, that this is going forward. Um, Carl, we think you're just fabulous. Keep up pushing for the best in the city. And please help me to welcome Ed Carpenter to Wichita. Mm -hmm. Actually, she's saying such wonderful things, I really wanted her to keep talking. <laughs> that was definitely a lot nicer than any of my council members say. <laughs> you know, I will say, I will say, we've had an opportunity, we've been working on this airport for many, many years. Over 10 years. To be exact, <laughs> over 10 years. And, uh, and we've seen a lot of ideas come and we have seen a lot of ideas go, <laughs> over 10 years worth. Mm -hmm. But after seeing this, I say we're there. 
We're, we're there. We're there with a new airport, and the art is just absolutely beautiful. And uh, I've traveled to other places and seen other airports, and I'm here to tell you that we rank with the very top of them. I mean, this is really something else, so I have to say thank you. And I'm telling you this, this isn't what they scripted for me. I'm telling you this from what I have seen. Now, they didn't want me to continue talking about my views, but to tell you, to welcome each and every one of you, and I can't tell you again how delighted I am that this group of people in Wichita are so enthusiastic about the vibrant cultural life of our city. We're blessed with many museums and strong art museums in Wichita. Let me extend my thanks to all of you for acting as patrons of the, Ultra, of the Ulrich and the nonprofits need people to appreciate and get behind their causes. And I congratulate you on being here for the Ulrich Museum. I am honored to welcome you to the special presentation this evening. As the mayor of Wichita, it gives me great delight to meet Ed Carpenter and to think ahead what he will contribute to our city. The city of Wichita is the air capital of the world. Soon, he will construct a new airport for our 21st century needs. It is a building that will look to and carry us into the future. The city of Wichita is also a community that emphasizes excellency, creativity, ingenuity, our new airport will be an important gateway to our city for many people who come here. We want visitors, as well as our own citizens, to appreciate what we have in Wichita. So is to its special. The design of our new airport and the work of public and art that we commissioned and placed the new facility we are very, very important to us. The artwork should signal to anyone who passes through our airport our values of excellence, creativity, ingenuity. We think we've discovered just the artist to help us with this challenge. With you, I am so eager to learn about Ed Carpenter and the strong works of art he has created around the world. Soon, we will be able to claim that we too have an artwork by this exceptional artist. Please, everyone, this is on target. We are there. Please join me in welcoming Ed Carpenter. <laughs> I wish my mother were here. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia, Sonia, all of those who have been uh, helpful to me in my trips here. Thank you to the design team that has designed this uh, wonderful airport. And uh, thank all of you for coming here on a basketball night. Um, I'm a basketball fan myself, so I understand if some of you have to leave at some point, feel, feel free. But uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, um, I couldn't have imagined uh, 40 years ago when I started on this journey that I would be here with you tonight, of course. None of us can imagine the path we're on. But um, I will show you some images from way back when, and you can imagine what a long path it has been. Um, although I'm only going to show you projects from the last uh, 10 to 15 years. So the, the older projects, some of which you can see on my website if you like. Um, but I'm going to try to show you uh, the beginning, the middle, and the end of a number of projects. So I'll show you initial sketches, talk about the impetus for the project, and um, how it developed, and then the final result to give you an idea of process. And of course, I'll finish by discussing the scheme I've been working on for your airport. Um, see what else I should say as a preamble. I, I, I just would like to say that um, this is precisely the kind of work I like to do. And it's, I couldn't imagine being in a better position, personally, artistically, creative, than the one I'm in here where I, I get to solve problems with a group of uh, very intelligent people who have already been working on uh, setting the stage for, for the problems that I inherit. 
Um, I get to work with a community. I get to do something that has lasting value. And I get to do something that, that has ch technical challenges as well as aesthetic challenges. And uh, once we receive our final approvals, I'll be going forward and involving engineers and lighting consultants and others who will become part of this team. And it's a big group effort on every one of these projects. And it, it takes a community to uh, visualize the project in the first place and to get the funding for it and so on. And then I come along later and I become just part of that big effort, whether I'm use, uh, working in a university or at an airport or for a courthouse or whatever. I'm a small player in a, in a much larger effort. And, and so that's incredibly gratifying for me to be part of a community. And I've been part of the Portland arts community for a long time, serving on the types of committees that I was appearing before today. And so I've been on both sides of that fence. And I know many of you are involved with uh, various kinds of public do-gooding, and I commend you for that. And uh, I've done that. And so I, I feel part of that big team. So let, let's uh, dim the lights, and um, we'll look at some projects. So I'm going to start with um, my predecessors. This is my, uh, my grandfather, Dudley Carpenter, in his studio in Denver in the early part of the last century. And he was a painter and a sculptor who, um, who I knew until he died in the late 50s. I played in his studio as a kid. And uh, I was around his work. He was an important part of the Santa Barbara, California arts community, a struggling artist who was supported by patrons uh, very like yourselves. And um, I, I never assumed that I would be an artist, but um, I ended up being in the family of an artist and an architect. This is my stepfather, Bob Alexander, with whom I grew up, who had an important practice in Los Angeles. Uh, after we moved to Los Angeles. And uh, he was in a partnership with uh, Richard Neutra for 10 years. And I worked in the Neutra and Alexander office as the office boy, as a young teenager. And uh, didn't really learn anything at all other than just to soak in the flavor of all that. Um, this is my then four-year-old son, Luke, who is now 17 who is a basketball player and uh, who played his first high school game of the season yesterday. So I'm all caught up in basketball as well. But at this time, uh, at f this was 13 years ago because Luke is now 17. But I show this slide because it illustrates how he was compelling, compellingly drawn toward the light from this sculpture of mine in Salt Lake City. And uh, that light is, is very compelling. Um, and of course, if it's generated by the sun, it moves. And that is an important quality of uh, the projects that you are about to see. This is Ludwig Schaffrat, uh, who just died this last year uh, after a long and fruitful life. But I studied with him in the early 70s in uh, his studio near Aachen in uh, then West Germany. And he was uh, one of the leading stained glass artists of the 20th century in Germany one of the leading stained glass artists uh, in the world, really. And I was very fortunate to be able to work with him and uh, learn from him, and then later to become a sort of propagandist for him in this country. I wrote uh, articles in Smithsonian Magazine and various glass magazines and art magazines about his work and about other uh, international glass artists that I was lucky to be with. Uh, Ludwig's work was unique uh, in that time, in that uh, it was, uh, had a very rigorous sense of lead and glass as the primary components of the medium at a time when uh, painterly glass and, and stained glass projects by painters were very common. Ludwig was working with the, the basic components of the medium. Uh, this is an example, uh, a detail from a very large window of his in Bad Swishenon in the West Germany, uh, where the two, there were only two kinds of glass one translucent and one transparent, and it interacted with the park outside. And well, a very beautiful project if you ever are over there. For for a number of years, I did stained glass commissions. Uh, of course, I started out doing little tiny stuff, and I got uh, residential commissions, and slowly worked my way up. Uh, this is typical of those. This is in Rockefeller Center, um, in what used to be the Exxon Building, is now uh, owned by a Japanese company, Mitsui Fudosan, and I did the glass in all of the uh, 
lobbies, all four lobbies, all around the entire block. And um, it was a, a massive commission done at the very end of their renovation project in a big rush. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I found it interesting to try to uh, relate what I was doing to the heroic nature of these um, Rockefeller Center buildings. Later, I got opportunities to work in a more three-dimensional way. And in St. Mark's Cathedral in Seattle, I proposed rather than simply making a rose window here in this wall to move inboard and create a chapel and uh, make something much larger because it's a very large room in this building which was uh, initially designed in the 20s but never finished and has a very sort of raw mammoth quality to it. So this is the um, an elevation for the screen and rows that I ended up doing in conjunction with a local Seattle architectural firm. And of course, the Rose Window has uh, a history that goes back more than a thousand years. Um, and I wanted to do something that was suggestive of the classic Rose Windows of, uh, that we know in Europe, um, but that was something very contemporary that would create this chapel. There are enormous doors uh, here that actually open up uh, I don't have a picture of them open, but it's quite dramatic when in the middle of the service they open, revealing the chapel. And um, there's a light control problem in this building, which this uh, configuration of the rows and screen helps to solve, as well as providing uh, a massive focal point within the sanctuary. So it's very three-dimensional and obviously made with techniques that are quite different from what Shafrat worked with or what our uh, traditional rose windows have been made with. I've worked in a lot of college campuses. This is the uh, new biomedical research building in uh, La Jolla at UCSD. And my stepfather, Bob Alexander, whose picture you saw earlier, designed the campus at UCSD when I was young, actually at the time when I was working summers in his office. And he designed two buildings which are immediately adjacent to this. And when I got the commission to work on this building, uh, it was complete hap happenstance. Uh, some 40 years later, uh, they didn't know that I was connected with Bob. I didn't realize that uh, it was so closely associated with his medical school. Um, and, and that was a wonderful thing to have happen all these years later. This typifies some of the interior projects that I've dealt with in that I surprise myself sometimes studying uh, the site. A lot of times the site is defined in a way that uh, is sort of stereotyped. Uh, the committee that chose me and the architects and even I felt that this atrium was probably where the work would go. But as I drew more and more uh, things suspended in this atrium, uh, the work looked like mall art to me, and all my, uh, all my designs were hideous, and I was becoming more and more depressed as it went on. Eventually, I realized that there was another opportunity, which was to move the work over and encompass these bridges, balcony bridges that uh, run up in front of the curtain wall here, and actually make a space that uh, the researchers in the building could inhabit. And um, Furthermore, the more I drew, the more I realized that I was beginning to draw shapes that were like ones that they might, those researchers might be seeing in their microscopes. So this typifies the sort of backwards way that the designs come to me in that normally it seems backwards because I don't get an idea and illustrate it. What I do is respond physically to a site, respond to the volume of a site, respond to how a site is used and then I discover forms. And in this case, I was able also to design the floor and a, compl and a bench at the bottom of the piece. And the more I worked on it, the, the more there became to be these, these relationships between the piece I was working on and what was happening in the building. And you may know that um, research science is frequently conducted in the hallways. That uh, yes, it happens in the laboratories, but a lot of a great interaction happens in the hallways, and so the people who design and build research buildings try to build in places like these benches all up and down here where the researchers can encounter each other in their off time. So I ended up uh, creating this piece which 
rises all six stories through the space, is tethered from the top, and uh, which can be literally inhabited by the researchers at every level. And it was something that I never could have imagined at the beginning, but that resulted from a process of sketching and drawing and three-dimensional modeling. Another such situation is for the, uh, uh, the convention center in Richmond, Virginia, where this bridge had been designed by the architects in advance. Um, and they uh, had left clear windows on either side so you could see right through the bridge. And I was asked to do some kind of a sculpture in association with the bridge. Um, I, I ended up doing just a big simple arch that uh, spans the full 100 foot length of the bridge and takes advantage of the fact that the sunlight comes in and strikes the sculpture and uses the ceiling and the floor and other surfaces as a projection surface. And as the sun moves, of course, those effects uh, move. At the ends, there are these strong anchors that are obviously part of the design. And um, so the piece has a very strong uh, kinetic quality during the day. At night, it's illuminated by lights at this level, just above eye level, which are uh, connected to a computer that slowly changes the projections up onto the ceiling. And so it has a very strong corollary experience at night and day. And although it was not in any way intended to be a, a depiction of anything from nature, uh, this photograph, which I took on my property uh, in the Oregon Coast Range of mountains uh, beside a river, reminds me of the kind of random effects that the, uh, the sculpture produces. And it's, it's that sort of uh, happenstance, visual happenstance, that to me is exciting. It's something that I couldn't have drawn, I couldn't have imagined in advance, but is the result of this process that ends up with a, a physical manifestation of that process. So the layering of the light is very rich and not unlike uh, that which you sometimes find in nature. For the new courthouse in Seattle, the federal courthouse, which has a quartz tower here and an office bar there and a very thin six-story atrium between the two, I was asked to do something in that atrium. And it's a very difficult space because it's very tall and very skinny. And so uh, I kept drawing these tall, skinny forms and uh, it, was, it was difficult to make ones that were transparent enough not to block the views from one side to the other where there are offices looking through it, um, and, but that also would uh, compete with this very big space and have a, have a presence there. And of course, what I'm trying to do is to give this space character, to make the space better for what it's intended to be for, and to, um, to make it unique, uh, but also to solve some practical problems uh, which is that I don't want to block views, I want to create views, and I want to have it be special from all sides. So the leaf I just showed you is from an alder tree, which is uh, very common in the Tillamook Forest where I live, uh, out in uh, near Portland. And when there's a landslide or a forest fire, uh, or any sort of, sort of devastation in the forest, the alders are the first to come back, and they have a sort of a... Uh, a, they refresh the forest in that respect. They provide shade for the slower growing conifers and they have a, a, a restorative role within the forest. So that seemed an apt metaphor for this federal courthouse. And so I drew leaves, uh, but then I wanted to connect this to the structure of the building and these rays emanating out from the leaf kind of suggested photosynthesis to me. And uh, so it developed into an abstract reference to a leaf, but not a depiction, uh, literally, of a leaf. But it's like an alder leaf. But again, the metaphor occurred to me after I had started as a result of the physical exploration of the space, not as the initial starting point. So here we are laying out this uh, gigantic sculpture in the parking lot of my subcontractor that uh, helped build this. And everything fit perfectly, and I was really uh, thrilled. What I, what I had forgotten 
was that, of course, when I went to install this, gravity would act different, differently on it than it did out in that parking lot. And so as I built it up from the bottom with my big crew that I bring to all my installations, we got to the top and we were off by 14 inches. <laughs> and, um, and it's just because gravity was pulling on it in a way that it wasn't out there in that parking lot. Well, I knew it would fit. A quick run to Home Depot, buy a come along and crank it into place. And by God, it was such a cheer when we got that pin in the very top because I, I had nightmares. Chris, you can imagine this because you've, you've done big sculpture before. But anyway, it was uh, there 45 feet in the air, and uh, I, I was imagining all sorts of disasters, but it, it worked out fine. And uh, so this also interacts with the sunlight when it enters. Uh, not ver very often. This is a very slender skylight, so the sun is only aligned uh, at particular times of the day. There I am surveying it from the fourth level. And uh, the glass in it uh, is uh, not identical to the glass that I have proposed for your airport, but similar in that it is different from different angles. It's a dichroic glass, but this is a, a slightly different color of dichroic glass. Um, but that glass is the same as this glass, and is the same as that glass. But it has when it has a different background, you see it differently. Here you're seeing it in uh, in transmitted light. Here you're see it, seeing it in reflected light. And so it's the same glass, just a, a different color, and it depends on your angle to it. This gargantuan building, uh, when I worked on it uh, a number of years ago, well, now only six or seven years ago, was at the time the biggest structure in the state of Arizona. And uh, it a dubious distinction, I realize. But it's, it's the consolidated rental car center at their airport. So if you go to Phoenix to um, to rent a car, you're going to rent, a, rent it in this building. And um, I worked with the architects from the uh, initial design of the building to help uh, conceive this, the, the, uh, how we would deal with the art and how we, would, how we could possibly make this uh, program special. And we decided that we would use natural light as the theme of the building because, of course, natural light is the most abundant resource in the state of Arizona. And uh, it's the reason that all these people went there to rent their car in the first place. Um, and so you just saw a section through the building, and now you're seeing a plan of the building. And these yellow areas are, are the areas that I worked in uh, where we designed these skylights. And the skylights were all designed, furthermore, to have mirrors that would bounce the light uh, down toward the artwork, which would further bounce the light down into the spaces. Here are some of the members of the huge design team in my studio uh, working with the model models that I built of several spaces there. And we had some wonderful charrettes playing with uh, how we would configure these skylights, where we would put the mirrors, how we would activate the spaces. And here are some shots taken inside the models. These are half inch to the foot models, so they're, they're really quite big. So the idea was to make these spaces like the canyons uh, that you're familiar with in Arizona and to create a kind of a geological feeling in the striations, but that also gives a place to anchor the artwork. So here we are installing in the big curving area in what's called the retail area where you actually rent your car, and it's an 800 foot long space. The mirrors are up here all the way around. The, the sun comes through, hits those mirrors, and bounces down onto this wall and onto the floor and activates the dichroic glass, which it stitches its way all the way from the end all the way to the other end. And here are some of the projections, uh, actually reflections on the floor, and these are the projections up on the wall. And it gives some remarkable effects all from these little thin strips of glass. So it's a very simple, minimal intervention in the space, simply accenting the forms of the architecture, uh, but producing effects that are changing all day long. And of course, when you come back to return your car, those effects will be different than they were when you picked up your car. If you come back in another season, they will be different and so on. So it's always uh, rewarding. And here are some of these effects, which 10 minutes from now will be slightly different. Mm -hmm. Installing was fun in these <laughs> very high spaces. 
We had to have lifts that would take us 100 feet up into the skylight. And uh, here are some, that, that's a picture in uh, just looking up one of those uh, wells. So uh, this is an exterior project, uh, a sort of a fuzzy Google images uh, shot down over this site, which is, was a difficult one because it's the entrance to an industrial park in Los Angeles. And uh, it's hard to find a metaphor for an industrial park. And well, what do you do? They're, they were required by the city of Santa Fe Springs to, uh, to, to uh, commission art and, and to commission an art plan. And I was luckily the recipient of one of their sites, which is at this intersection at the entrance to the park. The, the committee that selected me and the owners of the site, I think imagined that I would work on one of these corners but these are really, this is sort of uh, boxy retail on either side, and I wanted to get as far away from that ugly architecture as I could, and I <laughs> proposed to work out in the middle of the street. And that caused a lot of head scratching in the city streets department and a, a lot of uh, design issues and so on, but we solved them eventually working together. Here are a bunch of sketches that I did on an airplane and various other places studying um, how this might work. Um, some of these sketches are for uh, when I was considering working on the corners and some uh, deal with the center median. Uh, an early computer rendering studying how this uh, uh, form would work. I wanted it to be very tall so that it could be seen from a distance, but it had to be very skinny because of this little island that it was on. Uh, working drawings. Uh, and so the process of going from sketches through mock-ups to uh, engineering to working drawings so that the fabricators can actually make them is fascinating to me because they're all so different, but they're all telling part of the same story. Here are the patinaed copper panels in the shop, uh, fitting them up and uh, building the traffic island. Uh, lighting is important. Electrical comes up through the middle, all kinds of things to work out. Uh, there it is, it's like a big boat that supports this sculpture. Of course, we had to design it so that cars wouldn't come up over it and uh, ruin the art. Um, and here's the inner structure. Um, this, this structure, which then receives these poles, was uh, really big and, and, and it challenged the galvanizing people and in fact won some sort of award. The, uh, American Galvanizing Association uh, you know, the project of the year or something like that because it was so challenging for them for them to galvanize this thing. Um, one of the small side benefits of my line of work. But um, I, I love the installations. I lead the installation crew on every one of my projects except the really big ones like bridges. I, I designed a number of bridges, which I'm not showing you tonight, but um, they, they get installed by others, but I like to get up in the lifts and actually do these installations. Here's a, a, a member of my crew who is also my lighting designer, or was for many years, now he's doing something else. But uh, I've been lucky to have the same guys on my crew for decades, and we really have fun with the installations. And um, there's a sort of a culture around that. But th this ended up being suggestive of some sort of upwelling some sort of uh, imagery that is associated with Santa Fe Springs, the springs of Santa Fe Springs, and the, the development company I was working for was called the Golden Springs Development Company. So although it's not golden, it, it has this upward feeling. Uh, it's optimistic, and it's a, it's a marker that uh, celebrates the entrance to their development, which is unmistakable and unforgettable, and that's usually what I'm part of what I'm trying to do. A, a very different sort of solution to a somewhat similar exterior site is for the new John Burns Medical School in Honolulu. And if you know Honolulu, you know that halfway between downtown and Waikiki is uh, Kaka'ako, which is this park that was made out of the old city dump. And um, because it used to be the city dump, the surfing area there is called flies. <laughs> and uh, I talked to some surfers and they said, oh, we're going to flies. And I said, well, where's that? And they said, well, that's Kaka'ako. Well, okay, now I understand why it's called flies. But they got rid of the flies, they put the, the dump underneath whatever they do, and they turned it into this marvelous city park and they built the new medical school right next to it. And I was asked to do something, go back, uh, at this corner. 
and which makes it really, well, actually, I, I was told that I could do something in the atrium or outside. I chose to work on the corner, but that makes it the entrance to the park as well as to the medical school. So that's a kind of an interesting problem. Um, and I got interested in the taro plant and its beautiful leaves. There are thousands of kinds of taro plants, and they have played a very important role in Polynesian culture over millennia, both spiritually and physically. And they have sustained the Polynesian people as a central part of their culture. Uh, they're also, it's also a medicinal plant, and the John Burns Medical School is interested in such things as medicinal plants and alternative traditional medicine. And so uh, taro ended up being the theme for this. Uh, the Hawaiian uh, Polynesian uh, creation myth also involves taro, the, uh, one of the gods that, uh, out of which humanity, uh, one of the gods which created the world um, sprang from the navel uh, that was created by a taro plant. So something like that. It's complicated. But um, anyway, so taro is very important. And um, I wanted to do this, something that would wrap around the building. So I had to find elements that I could afford within the budget that uh, would be scaled with this building, that would create a sense of movement around the building, and would um, fit into this environment. So there are these sort of uh, reed-like elements that start all the way at the entrance and wrap all the way around the building. And then occasionally there are these enormous uh, tarot leaf-like objects floating among them. And there is a pico or navel uh, in the uh, central one at the corner. And uh, the use of glass here is uh, valuable in that it creates a sense of life uh, on the surfaces. You can also look down uh, on that from up in the building. And uh, so it, it gives color and uh, a sense of, of uh, vitality to the sculpture. And I, I love the combination of glass and metal because they're such different materials and they do such different kinds of things with light. Here's, this is the, um, the dedication uh, and they had a, a traditional Hawaiian medicine man come and uh, bless the sculpture, which I thought was great. Uh, this building is the uh, a new city hall in Redmond, Washington, which is uh, east of Seattle. The Snohomish River runs along here. The entrance to the building is here, and there's a park all along here. This is the police headquarters, the library, various civic buildings. So there's a big civic kind of uh, campus there. And uh, this is a planned view of the building. The entrance is here, a big pool all around the entrance. Here's an elevation. And um, I decided to do a big gesture that leads toward the entrance. This arc form, you'll recognize, this keeps popping up in my work. It's not dissimilar from what uh, you'll be seeing at the end of this slideshow in, in plan. It's very, this is very different in elevation. But um, I wanted to make a big gesture leading toward the entrance that would interact with this strong east light there and work against this beautiful copper wall. And um, the, the more I drew these jutting sort of pickup stick forms uh, coming up out of this pool, the more I realized that they reminded me of, uh, now you have ice storms here too, so you know this, that um, in the Pacific Northwest we also have ice storms and every blade of grass gets covered with ice. We call that a silver thaw. Do you use that term? Um, well, a silver thaw it, it occurs when everything gets covered with ice. And, and so the name of the sculpture is Silver Thaw. And its elements, obviously, uh, are reminiscent of that. Of course, that wasn't where I started with this design. I started by addressing the physical circumstance and the materials and the fact that there was the water here. And there's this wonderful opportunity to reflect the piece in the water. And as you move around it and from every angle, there are different views. And um, so uh, it's very rewarding for me to discover uh, all these different compositions within the work which I could never have imagined. In fact, this piece was, uh, it was engineered to be set up on uh, a series of stable pyramidal 
uh, structures of, of three elements. And they were uh, tied in, anchored into the pool, and then carefully connected to the top. But the rest of the sculpture was all improvised on site, and that was really fun. Uh, it took longer than normal, but it was a great process of putting up one stick at a time. And when I, after I got all the aluminum up, then I went back and put all the glass in. These playful, quick sketches are typical of the kind of quick sketches that I do to start these projects. And uh, in the old days, I used to do hundreds of them, and I was always terrified that I would n not come up with a solution, and it would take me months to solve the problems. And now it's much quicker because I know that if I keep working this way, I will eventually come to a solution. And, and in fact, I, uh, I have found that at about the time when I start cursing the site and my client and the architects I'm working with and everybody, then I realize, oh, I'm about to find the solution here because I'm getting really grumpy. And, and, uh, and, and, and knowing that I go through those stages in my process m makes it a lot less stressful. So anyway, this, this is a sketch for a project at Portland State University at, in their new engineering building. And there's a plaza there. And once again, a big arcing form, which is activating this plaza. And um, a big shape that curves through the plaza. Uh, this plaza is created by the engineering building, which you see here, and the, the city county uh, permit building, where the building department is, and the planning department right next to it. So they looked down on this thing, and I'll, I'll tell you, they were tough on the engineering. We had to engineer this for 100 mile an hour winds and three inches of ice simultaneously. Um, so the, uh, being able to keep it slender was a real trick uh, of my engineers, and I compliment them on that. So here I'm getting uh, more and more detailed sketches, and part of the problem here was to understand how to, to work with both up and down light. Uh, so how to, to design integral light fixtures that would look good and work. Uh, shots in the uh, fabrication studio. We are installing the glass onto the stainless steel structure here. And here, uh, the big truss putting it together on a Sunday when we could block 4th Avenue, which is a major Portland Avenue, uh, and had an, this enormous crane, which you can't really see all of here, to lift it into place and we had built these towers to lift it onto uh, details from the stainless steel structure. And here we've lifted it onto these jacks on these towers so that we can get it exactly in the right place in space and uh, setting the big south anchor. The, the piece is called Tecotage, which you can see here is composed of the first two letters of the four principal uh, parts of structural engineering. Tension, compression, torsion, and shear are the principal forces that uh, structural engineers are concerned with. And since this is an engineering building, that seemed appropriate. Again, I didn't design the piece with that in mind. Originally, I designed it to be successful physically within this space, and then I realized that I could push it in a direction that addressed uh, structural engineering. So. I, I love this big anchor here, this giant thing which holds the, what appears to be an enormous force. Uh, in fact, the piece will stand up by itself without that. But, um, and it's, it's tensioned at the other end. Um, and it's held up by these apparently very, very skinny legs. And there are some uh, tricky little anchors down there that I'll show in a minute. And here's a night shot showing the up and down lights. It's a LEED certified building, so I was limited to 1,000 lumen lights uh, in the up lights, and that's a severe limitation. It's hard to get something very bright, so there are lots of lights, uh, but it could be brighter. Um, but I love the, the moods it has. When it rains, you get these reflections down below, and of course, we get plenty of that in Portland. And, and you can see that uh, the buildings on both sides look down into it. So it's contributing to all these levels of, of both buildings as well as to the major thoroughfare out in front. And it is an invitation to the engineering building, but it's also saying something about what goes on inside. Oop. The shadows move across through the plaza, uh, glass details. Uh, this is one of those anchors. This is a universal joint. 
uh, because I, it was hard to predict the precise angle that things had to be set at, had to design this joint which we could uh, strap these uh, verticals to and then weld them and get the exact position electrical has to come up through there. So there's a bunch of tricky things that, that those anchors have to do and I was pleased in the end with the way they worked out. Night shot. This is Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I arrived toward the end of their troubles, uh, but won an international competition for this site uh, at the Broadway Roundabout. And you can see in the foreground the aftermath from some of the battles that took place at this very site. Uh, the far side is Catholic, the near side is Protestant, and um, they were, the, the M1 motorway comes up from um, Dublin, and arrives in Belfast right here, and used to dump right into the Broadway roundabout, a terrible mess, you know, the entire freeway, the biggest freeway in Ireland dumping into this roundabout. So they decided to put the roundup of the, the freeway underneath, but, and that would mean rebuilding this um, spot. And uh, so they were worried that when they took the trees off that the center of the roundabout there, it would become contested territory between the Protestants and the Catholics. So they wanted to put a big sculpture there. My design involved um, the idea of sort of renewal and uh, that, that's exemplified by a flower. And uh, this is a, a case where, again, where I, I sensed that a, a very large um, monument was necessary because you could see it from a very great distance. I designed these forms and then I realized that it was like a blossom or like a seed pod or something like that. Here you can see the freeway going underneath. Interesting problem, like another one I'll show you in a minute, in that the, the sculpture wanted to be very big, but it had to be very lightweight because it's over, uh, it's a bridge, it's on a bridge that goes over the freeway essentially. Um, so how, how to make something that's 150 feet tall that doesn't overload the structure. So very delicate, and um, everybody loved it, and, but they, they failed to allocate any money for it for three years after I was selected, and that three years was the three years during which the price of steel went up more than in any other part of the history of humanity. And by the time the money was finally allocated, it was uh, way over budget. They, they then had another competition. I was shortlisted for that competition and I didn't win. I did a very conservative design for that one. So uh, it was a big bummer. But bummer. anyway, this sculpture is available. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I, I boast about doing site-specific things, but I, could, I might be able to uh, fit it in somewhere else. If, uh, yeah. uh, well, it was, the budget was, uh, let's see, it was 400,000 pounds, which was about, when we started, it was about $600,000. Um, and I think uh, in the end, it would have cost about $800,000. And that was about uh, three or four years ago. So, you know, call it, round it off at a million, and you can have it right in the middle of your town. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So here's one that's a little bit a smaller site, but has some similar constraints. And I'll just show you a, a few more projects. Um, how am I doing for time? All right. Um, this is the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. And you see an aerial photograph of it in the back. This is Lake Union right here. And uh, in the center of their campus is a roundabout, much smaller than the one in Belfast. And I won a competition for that spot. You think maybe it needs something? Yeah. It's a, a little bare there. But uh, they have eight or ten buildings. They're a leading cancer research uh, facility. They have a, a research hospital there. And uh, there's a tunnel that runs underneath this that connects these buildings. So once again, it, the sculpture wanted to be big, but it had to be lightweight. So here's a sketch for it. Here's a, a rendering. My idea was that it would be a sculpture that would be, uh, you could actually pass through the center of along this axis between the two buildings, and there would be vines that would grow up and a leafy canopy 
of uh, trees around it um, and fragrant uh, blossoms at some times of the year and so on. And it would be very delicate and um, illuminated at night. And I'll, I'll show you pictures of the final uh, process. Here, uh, my contractor is laying out the foundations and uh, here building the foundation, getting ready to pump the concrete in. And uh, here we are constructing it. I, I constructed this uh, with two different crews. The, I hired a, a metalworking firm in Seattle to build the, the metal structure. And uh, they and I erected that um, here. And then uh, over here, after the metal structure was erected, I brought my glass crew in from Portland and we put all the glass in it. So here's a night shot. Um, this one has a lot of moods, as you would expect, uh, being so delicate and using this special glass. This is glass very similar to what I'm proposing for you here, and you, you'll see in this next series of slides how many different kinds of things it does. Um, these are reflections off the glass. These are projections off the, the same glass. Um, so it, it reflects the complement of the color that it projects. And here's this woman is walking right through all of that. Now, this is in full sun. Um, we'll discuss the, the airport, but the, your airport has a very slender skylight, so it'll just be at particular times of day that we're able to get effects like this, but that's one of the things I'll be trying for. And uh, projections or reflections on the adjoining buildings. And uh, of course, the glass is very much richer as you get closer to it, and this is all quote, one color of glass, but we're seeing it at different angles. And so because of those different angles, because there's a color shift from the many layers of metal oxides deposited on the glass, um, you get these different colors all from one color. Uh, I'm going to show you two very recent projects and then that'll be it. This is in the Raleigh-Durham airport. One of you just passed through there recently. Um, and. Um, this is in their central axis. You pass through this, you go down these escalators to, to baggage. You come in up above, ticketing is beyond there. Uh, there's a lot of wood used in this airport, and so I ended up doing something that involves wood. Um, as usual, part of my problem was to figure out how to make something that was in scale with the building, but also in scale with budget. And so I decided to use these slender, elegant, uh, tapered poles, and I had a good time finding subcontractors. There aren't many people in the country that can make a 60-foot tapered hollow uh, Douglas fir pole, and uh, that that was fun. And in, I guarantee you that installing this was fun. Um, and I, I worked for years with my engineer and staying up at night trying to figure out how to do it, and I was terrified that my system wouldn't work. Um, but it did, and we, we got it up, and all the, all the tensions in the cables were lower than the thresholds that we had established and so on, so it worked great. And it was very, very satisfying to do something that um, appears uh, to be weightless in, in the space. And people walk in there and they say, how in the world did they put that up? Which is, which is great. That's exactly what I want people to say. Um, but it, too, has um, a lot of life from, from different angles. The glass looks different from this angle and that. This in includes uh, integral LED lighting in the tips of these giant masts. Uh, th these masts and the wood in them are related very vaguely to the rich craft tradition in North Carolina, and that's part of what uh, the architects were using for inspiration, and I just kind of drafted on that. But it's very much a response to the space. Uh, these anchors have LED lighting in them, and uh, I loved making the anchors themselves very significant. This is Michigan State University, their new um, campus commons building. A, a big atrium leads upstairs to their food court, and a big blank ceiling that I could use as a canvas to play light off onto. Uh, lighting is on the curtain wall here, stepping up. Uh, shining up through the sculpture onto the ceiling. Of course, we're seeing it now in daylight. This light play on the ceiling is from the sun coming in and striking the glass. Uh, a colorful central armature. 
connected back to structure, and then those cables carry uh, decorative elements. Two different shots, from uh, one from the end and one from the middle. Night, you can see again the lighting along the curtain wall, uh, carefully aimed to create these light paintings up on the ceiling. Uh, there is a controller for uh, these lights which will very slowly change the compositions on the ceiling. When I was there last, it hadn't been programmed yet, so I'm looking forward to going back and working with that to uh, program that. So, uh, a, a rich palette as it gets darker and darker outside, and finally the outside view looking in. Two slides from a project that I'll be installing this spring um, in Council Bluffs, Iowa. This is a sort of a confusing composition where there's a, an eleva elevation superimposed over the sky there. This is a bridge that I, I'm working on, uh, a viaduct that runs through the center of the city and dumps down into to, uh, the center uh, downtown. Here it's seen in plan, here it's seen in elevation. I'm, I helped design the whole bridge sort of uh, establishing this rhythm of outward leaning poles that uh, go all the way along and ascend as you get to the middle. And then I'm doing a big gateway in the center of the bridge there that's 100 feet wide and uh, about 70 feet high. Um, and will be at, that'll be done probably by June. This is a, a four lane highway. Can, can you see that there's something wrong with this image? This car is on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> it's not England. Okay, so you recognize this. I'm sure everyone here does. Um, this uh, beautiful shape that uh, will house your uh, terminal. And um, for me, this is a marvelous uh, set of uh, parameters to work with. This is uh, Wes. Uh, has said a number of times, one of your architects, that the palette is uh, specifically neutral to make room for the art and to make room for the signage and to, to not be overwhelming 20 years from now when your favorite colors this year are no longer your favorite colors. And um, so it, it's, a, it's a real challenge because this is a very long site and uh, I would like to um, do something that addresses as much of the site as possible. Um, there, are, there are only certain places where there's structure to attach to. Um, so what I came up with, with was the idea of a big curving arch through the space that starts low, goes high, up over this mezzanine which will contain uh, the aviation exhibits and then descends back down again. Uh, once again attaching to one of the columns. So it's a very strong sense of it being connected to the structure of the building and it's about ascent and descent and about forms that are reminiscent of aviation. I was asked to do something that was about aviation, uh, that echoed aviation, and I enjoyed going to the Spirit Air Frame <coughs> Factory and to your local aviation museum and uh, we talked a lot about the need, the, the desire to somehow refl reflect this rich tradition from Wichita. So these kinds of forms uh, were important and you'll see those appearing in the sculpture. So I just have these rather preliminary schematic drawings showing its relation to the space. There is um, beautiful light that will come through the skylight across this wall back here. The, the sculpture is anchored back to that wall and then only in two places on the curtain wall. And it sweeps through the entire space as you ascend uh, the escalator or the stairs or descend from your flight. You'll actually have a feeling of passing very close to the sculpture, almost through it, and up on this balcony, of course, you'll be uh, again very close to it. The sculpture is reaching up toward the light, uh, trying to get as much of its uh, substance into the light as possible to interact with that light and uh, will have a strong kinetic quality 
As you pass through it, the dichroic glass will be activated in different ways as your position in relation to it changes. At different times of day, the light striking it from the skylight will create patterns on the, uh, the architecture that should be different every time you pass through. So uh, I'm very excited about uh, moving to the next phase, which, which will be the actual uh, engineering of the piece and uh, figuring out the anchors, working with the design team, getting a contract. Um, <laughs> one, one thing or another. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so this is my last slide, and um, I hope it's exciting to you, and I hope I have your support in this endeavor. I need it, and um, I look forward to answering your questions. Yes. Yeah. The, the question is, uh, what? How do I consider seismic issues? And of course, I work with engineers on every project, and uh, they will stamp the the working drawings, and they are required to uh, make the sculpture conform to the local codes. And this type of structure is very ductile and will uh, respond beautifully in an earthquake. Uh, and it will, it'll be the last thing to go. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I don't find that I'm any less successful working with uh, a building that's already been designed or even already exists necessarily. Um, I, I would all, always prefer to start early because th th there are more opportunities, but uh, coming in late isn't necessarily death. Um, and every project is a combination of integration and inter intervention. Uh, and I'm always striving f for, for the tension between intervention and integration. If it's too integrated, it just looks as if it was uh, built by the contractor and, and you don't notice it. If it's, if it's, uh, if it's too much of an in intervention, it might look jarring in the space or it might, it, it can even make a space uninhabitable. Um, I'm thinking of a, of a sculpture by a major international sculptor in the Toronto airport that I saw recently, which when I encountered it, I was absolutely appalled. I actually like this artist's work a lot. He's one of the best known artists in the world. But uh, a committee had put oh, an enormous piece of his right into the middle of this airport, and it was this big, heavy, opaque thing that just destroyed the space. To me, it made it uninhabitable. And it was an example of not understanding that some analysis is necessary to understand what's, what's the proper solution for a proper space. You can't just put any sculpture in, in any place. And so your question is very well taken, and, and it's uh, both attitudes are necessary, and uh, it can happen. You can be successful or unsuccessful either in a new building or an old building. Yes. Your work is uh, out to the public, and I'm kind of wondering if you've had any difficulties with graffiti. The reason I ask that is that we have a, an elevated rail corridor through the city here that has some decorative elements to it. And I noticed just recently that the graffiti boys have found it. Yeah. Is that a good problem with any of your projects? 
it, I think there might have been one case. There was that project that I showed you in Golden, uh, in Santa Fe Springs, California, that has the copper panels at the bottom. It's out in the middle of a street. And that one did get graffitied, but I had, and I, I guess I hadn't actually coded it the first time around. I went back and I took off the copper panels and I re patinaed them. Um, and then I put an anti graffiti sacrificial coating on. And I haven't heard of whether they've had any problems. Uh, it's that's the only one of my projects that has had that issue. And, and I'm always concerned with that. Um, and that's, that's partly a siting issue, and it's partly a materials issue, and it's partly a be ready to fix it when they do it issue. And I don't, I don't have the silver bullet from that, but I think you have to think about it at, at all those steps. Yeah. Yes. The, um, the dichroic glass is mostly manufactured in, uh, in Pennsylvania by a, a German company called Flebeg, and I use them because they can make large sheets. And um, there are lots of companies that make dichroic glass for scientific purposes in relatively small two-foot chambers, but the, the outfit that I use makes bigger sheets, and that's useful for me. But So I buy the, the raw glass from them, and then I have it shipped usually to Portland, and where we cut it up and do things with it, either uh, just put edge work on it or laminate it or uh, put a safety film on it or uh, and then uh, silicone it into aluminum channels or stainless attach it to stainless steel or do all the things that we do with it so there are a number of steps with the glass and, it, and the glass is always engineered as well um, for the local winds or to be sure that it's going to be completely safe because um, obviously uh, well like like all parts of the sculpture they have to be there forever and not be dangerous and be easy to clean and all that. Yeah. Is anybody? Yeah. How is it maintained? Well, that's that's a good question. The maintenance is something I'm concerned about from the beginning, and then the first part of maintenance is access. And if I can install it, you can clean it. <laughs> that's that's the first part of that but the second part is to use materials that don't show the dirt every every every, every space is dirty and there's there's dust in every space but uh, I, I install these things so that you can't touch the glass it's always starts at 10 feet and then goes up from there uh, and if you can't touch the dirt you can't disturb it then you don't really know how filthy it is. <laughs> um, that, that's part of it. But, but then you do have to clean it uh, every now and then. And some, some clients clean their work once a year and some never clean it. And, and um, you know, the, the results sometimes show and they sometimes don't. But I, I designed that these materials are as forgiving as any. Stainless steel, aluminum, glass, they're, they're hard to damage and uh, the, the type of dirt and grime that falls on them in a building or even outside in an outside site aren't going to harm them. They're permanent materials. Um, in an inside site, we frequently just reach up into the sculpture with a feather duster on a pole and just dust it once a year. Or, or you get up on a lift and you can actually reach everything and clean it with a rag and a bottle of Windex. On the outside, you can frequently just get on a lift and pressure wash it. And that's, that's all you do. Um, but the truth is, most of my clients don't clean them very often. That's Victor's problem. Yeah. Yes. Not the specific oxides, but I. Um, you, you must be the coatings guy. You must be the. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember we talked. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I don't. I specify the color. And Steve Zebert knows how to make it, <laughs> the guy that I deal with at, at Flebeg. And uh, if, if I tell him I want cyan glass, he knows that that means it's cyan in perpendicular transmitted light. Um, and he, he knows exactly what that means. And I tell him the thickness that I want and how many sheets and so on. Um, and he can make, you know, eight different colors. And I can tell him 
you know, well, it's okay to have shading in this or it's not, or there are a number of things that he can do right or wrong. And so I give him some direction, but it's not the chemicals themselves or the oxides. No, that's, that's one piece of glass. And um, this pink isn't very accurate. It'll actually be more a sort of orange or copper colored. But um, b because there are numerous layers of metallic oxides deposited on the glass, very thin, what happens is the light bounces back to your eye from different layers. And imagine a big long piece of glass. The near end of it is at one angle to your eye, and the far end of it is at a slightly different angle to, to your eye. And so the light that's coming to your eye from the far end is coming from a different layer of those metallic oxides, and that accounts for the different filtering of the light and the different apparent color. And of course, somebody on the other side of it would be seeing it in a totally different color because it depends on the background whether they're seeing it in ref reflected or transmitted light. If there's a light background, they're seeing it in transmitted light. If there's a dark background, they're seeing it in reflected light. So, and and part of the trick is that glass is heavy, and uh, so I'm always trying to use and it's and this glass is very expensive. So the trick is how what's the the critical amount that you can use that will really activate the sculpture and be marvelous in the space, but it's not going to overload the structure or or the budget. <laughs> And uh, so that's the trade-off. Okay. And really just to expand on everything that we've gleaned from what he's been saying, it's experiential. Um, the images don't do justice to being in the space with these works of art. And, we soon will have this in our own airport, right, Victor? That building's going right up <clears throat> in three years, three and a half years. So I'm just so pleased that all of you heard it here at the Ulrich Salon Circle first. So thank you, Ed. We are, some of us are proceeding to dinner, and this is the first time that we've held a salon in this space. And for some of you who aren't familiar with the Marcus Welcome Center, the the dining room is at the opposite end of the building and to your right. So regardless, thank you all so very much for coming and happy holidays in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Thank you.